<clears throat> well, thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction, uh, Norman, uh, and thank you all for, for being here today. Um, I want to start by also paying my respects to the Gadigal people, elders past and present, including particularly Uncle Charles uh, Chicka Madden here, and pay my respects to their elders uh, past and present. Also thanks to Professors Ian Jacobs and uh, Barney Glover for, uh, for hosting today and for the commitment you've shown uh, to Sphere, uh, which is, as I say, I think will be a tremendously important part of the national uh, health innovation landscape in years to come. Um, as was mentioned, I think, earlier on, I'm standing in for Bill Ferris uh, today, the Chair of Innovation and Science Australia. Um, Bill was bitterly disappointed not to be here uh, today. As many of you would know, uh, he's been a long-time supporter of health and medical research in this country. Uh, he's demonstrated that commitment time and again through involvement uh, in great institutions here in Sydney, like the Garvin, uh, but also in a number of government reviews, uh, roles on various government panels. And most recently, and obviously, uh, is his involvement in innovation and Science Australia uh, as chair of our board uh, and uh, every now and again when you're working with the government, the government calls you to Canberra and you can't say no uh, and that happened today. So he's very sad he can't be here um, but uh, he did ask me to pass on his very best wishes uh, for a successful symposium. Um, I just wanted to start SPHERE, fantastic acronym as someone who likes to develop these kind of things. It's a great acronym and the words work really well, um, but I do really love that gifted name from the Darug people. That's pretty hard to beat. Marudulu, Budyari, Gumal, working together for good health and well-being. It's pretty clear, it does what it says on the tin and very, very cool. And, and the other thing that I really like about it, uh, and we heard this in, uh, in Chica's welcome, uh, the sense of place that our Indigenous people bring to uh, their understanding of the world is, is, I think, a really important thing to understand in the context of, of Sphere. Uh, when, when our elders welcome us to, to these lands and talk about the rivers to the north and the west and the south, they are positioning us at a, at a point in, in place. Um, and one of the things that's unique, really, about the, adv the, acad the Advanced Health Research and Translation Centres, of which Sphere is one, is that they are one of the few programs to support innovation that do have a sense of place, do have a sense of geography. Um, and as uh, Ian Jacobs said in his introduction, uh, the notion of an advanced health research and translation centre is actually something that we've, uh, in some senses, adopted from international practice. It's something that's been common uh, in Europe and North America. But I'd like to think uh, that here in Australia, uh, with our strong sense of place, uh, our strong sense of identity uh, with the land that I think we draw uh, from our Indigenous culture, we might be able to do uh, these kinds of uh, health research and translation centres better than anyone else around the world. I don't think Sphere should be as good as best practice internationally. I think Sphere can be better. Uh, and I think we in Australia should aspire to, to do that. Um, there are three things I really wanted to talk about uh, in, in the time that I have available today. I want to talk a little bit briefly uh, about Innovation and Science Australia. Um, Norman mentioned that we've got a, a plan uh, coming out, so then I'll talk a little bit about innovation in general, uh, broad themes of innovation in Australia, and then some specific remarks about health and medical research, which I think is really uh, one of the jewels in the crown of the Australian uh, innovation system and a tremendous opportunity for us as we look into the future. So what is Innovation and Science Australia? Well, it's a, it's a board, it's an independent statutory board uh, established by the government, chaired by Bill Ferris. The deputy chair uh, is Alan Finkel, the chief scientist, uh, and it comprised of 15 innovation and science practitioners, primarily taken uh, from the private sector. As part of the launch of the National Innovation and Science Agenda just uh, under two years ago, uh, the Australian government um, created ISA to evolve from what was known as the Innovation Australia Board uh, in the past. And for those who've been in the system for a long time, probably very familiar with the Innovation Australia Board. The thing that changed in the National Innovation and Science Agenda was that we were asked not just to oversee some of the programs like the CRC program uh, and the Entrepreneurs Program, but we were tasked to provide advice to government. Um, and crucially, it was whole of government advice. Um, so we are not tasked just to look at what happens, if you like, in the Department of in Industry, Innovation and Science, or the Department of Health, or, or the Department of Education and Training. It's across the entire uh, government suite. Um, and that's a new role in the system. Uh, that's the first time we've ever had something like that uh, in Australia. Um, and uh, so 
as our first task, the government said, well, we'd like you to, to lay out a strategic roadmap for how the national innovation system uh, can develop over the coming 10, 15 years um, and how we can achieve our full innovation potential uh, by 2030. And as you do, when you're given a task like that, uh, we began by reviewing the existing strengths and weaknesses uh, of the national innovation system, and we published those in a report uh, earlier this year. Uh, that review confirmed that we've been highly uh, inventive culture in the past, but we've frequently fallen short of translating and commercialising our discoveries. Uh, in brief, we're better inventors than we are innovators. And while we have the capability to be a top-tier innovation nation, we strongly believe, and in our analysis, we found plenty of the right ingredients, um, we are not putting them together in the right way and in the way that some of our um, competitors internationally are doing. And we are now at risk of falling behind our competitor countries in what we see as a global innovation race. So, so that formed, if you like, the backdrop to our report, uh, which we've recently uh, uh, handed to the Australian government. As I said, Bill's in Canberra engaging with the government uh, today uh, on that very topic. Um, and that report really asks or challenges Australia, how can we become uh, a leader in that global innovation race? Uh, the report is titled Australia 2030, Prosperity Through Innovation. Um, I'd love to be able to talk to you about it in detail, but that has to wait uh, uh, until it's officially released. But I'll talk so about some of the themes uh, that permeate that report uh, now. First thing was that in settling on, uh, in developing the report, the Innovation Science Australia Board settled on a vision for what does uh, a top tier innovation nation look like? What does a, a prosperous innovation country look like in the future? Uh, and we phrased it as follows. We said Innovation Science Australia's vision for 2030 is that Australia will be counted in the top tier of innovation nations. We'll take pride in our global reputation for excellence in science, research and commercialisation. And those world-leading strengths in innovation, science and research will benefit all Australians through strong economic growth, competitive industries and companies and collaborative education and knowledge institutions, plentiful jobs that are meaningful and productive and a fair and inclusive society with a high quality of life. It's a broad definition of what it means to be an innovation nation. It says that innovation is not serving a, a single end. It's not serving uh, technocrats or econocrats in the Treasury. It's delivering a better quality of life. Uh, in the area of health and wellbeing, it means our loved ones uh, live better and, and longer lives. It means our children grow up healthier. Uh, it means that uh, when we are afflicted uh, by the challenge of diseases, no matter how complicated they are, we have a system that can deliver world-class care. That, for us, is what a high-performing innovation nation looks like. Why is it important? Why do we even care about, uh, about innovation? Well, uh, as many of you would know, uh, we've just uh, created a world record with t over 26 years of uh, unbroken GDP growth. Um, some people say everything's fine. What, what, what are we solving for? What's the challenge here? Well, the reality is that much of that growth has been underpinned by two of our traditional big export sectors, agriculture and mining. Um, and although a significant natural resources endowment has provided great foundations to build on, um, that itself has required great innovation, risk-taking and export success that's enabled them to get there. So, you know, we've, we've actually built a lot of our success on some creativity and some innovation in traditional sectors. Um, and that runs through our history. Our tyranny of distance made inventiveness a necessity for early colonists, inspiring the, things like the stump jump plough, which enabled broad acre farming, and refrigeration, which allowed meat to be exported. Over the last century, uh, we've shown that we can mix it with the world. We've produced 15 Nobel Prize winners, particularly uh, in knowledge breakthroughs in medicine and physiology. However, more often than we'd like to see, uh, we failed to capture the full value of some of our many inventions. The black box fight recorder, the heart pacemaker, photovoltaic cells, although I know uh, Ian and his colleagues are doing their best to capture value from that uh, these days, X-ray crystallography and many others, all based on Australian research breakthroughs uh, that, that were created here uh, but commercialised and, and created value all too often uh, in other nations around the world. Looking to 2030, uh, we think innovation will be integral to the expansion of Australia's economy, keeping its workforce strong and addressing societal challenges. We'll need to be competitive in a global innovation race by scaling up more high-growth industries and companies commercialising more high-growth, high-value products and services, and crucially, fostering great talent. Most of all, we need to dare to tackle great challenges, great global challenges, uh, because the problems that we are trying to address these days are getting ever more complicated. 
So following those uh, recent decades of um, the helpful commodities boom and favourable terms of trade, as we look forward, we've got some challenges ahead. Um, those favourable terms of trade, that commodity boom uh, is fading into the past. And, and the other thing that has driven our prosperity over the last decade has been a growing workforce, um, which has been a key driver of our uh, long-run GDP growth. Um, but as you look at demographic change across society uh, and you look at how our workforce structure is changing, we can't count on that anymore. Um, we can't rely uh, on the, the growth of the workforce to deliver ever the growing wealth uh, into the population. So whilst as we went around the country and talked to people about innovation, we heard a lot of fear, a lot of uncertainty about in automation and machine learning and how technology might change the nature of work. Um, we look to 2030 and we actually worry not so much uh, about a shortage of jobs, but maybe a shortage of workers with the right skills to do the kind of jobs that we need. Um, as as the, the demographic balance shifts, we actually need uh, high, high productivity, high value workers, and, and our worry is maybe they won't be there. And, and no doubt, the nature of many jobs will change, the skills required will evolve. Uh, most new jobs will require digital skills, but a big chunk of them will also require interpersonal and entrepreneurial capabilities. So that's one of the reasons why, as we thought about our innovation system out to 2030, we thought about where do the priorities need to be, we spent a lot of time on education. We spent a lot of time on the human capital of our nation because innovation at heart, I strongly believe, is a profoundly human activity. And, and that means that the ultimate speed limit for a national innovation system uh, is the capability of our people. Uh, that will set the, the capacity of us as a nation out to 2030. And unfortunately, uh, in this regard, the story around innovation is not the one that you would want it to be. Um, many of you may be familiar with international comparisons of educational achievement uh, conducted uh, by the, under the OECD under the Program for International Student Assessment. Um, on key metrics that we think are really important to the future of our economy, uh, on science, on mathematics and on literacy, Australia's uh, results are trending down. Uh, that's the wrong direction for them to be going. Uh, at the same time, the money we are investing in education is going up. Um, so clearly we haven't got the right balance. We're spending more, uh, we're getting uh, worse outcomes. We need to find a way to turn that around. So that very quickly and very early on in our conversations for the board became the number one uh, challenge uh, for our innovation system out to 2030. Responding to the changing nat nature of work and making sure we equip all Australians with skills relevant to 2030. That was the first of five national imperatives that we identified. The imperatives uh, we see uh, need to be urgently addressed if Australia is to have any chance uh, at catching other nations and being that top tier innovation. Right now, uh, as you, if you measure us across a range of aggregate uh, innovation metrics, Australia is somewhere around the middle of the pack. Um, on some metrics, yes, okay, we're top quartile. Other, other metrics, we're bottom quartile or third quartile. Uh, if you take an average across a range of metrics, uh, we're somewhere around the middle of the pack. Um, and for us in Innovation Science Australia, and I think for the prosperity of current and future generations, uh, that's not enough. So the five imperatives, education is the first. The second one uh, is around industry and the business sector. We need to ensure Australia's ongoing prosperity by stimulating high growth firms and improving productivity. This is an area where Australia really uh, is not heading in the right direction again. Uh, our businesses are spending less and less on R&D, not more and more, as we see in our competitor nations. We need to turn that trend around. We need to make sure that our businesses are growing. The third imperative focuses on government. Uh, increasingly in areas that are of critical importance to our future, and health is a great example, the government is a key player. So we can't just look at the government as a piggy bank that provides funding uh, for the rest of the innovation system. The way the government conducts itself in the system is equally important. That means how it buys and sells goods and services, how it regulates new and emerging industries are really, really important factors uh, to consider uh, in the way that our innovation system develops. And so we'll be looking at the way uh, the government innovates in the way it delivers its own uh, services. The fourth imperative looks uh, at research and development. Um, and in this area, uh, as I mentioned before, we are actually blessed. 
Uh, the one thing that Australia has clearly worked out, I think, uh, really, really well is how to do world-class research uh, in a very cost-effective and efficient kind of a way. On whatever metric you choose to look at, uh, our, our universities and our publicly funded research agencies produce genuinely high-quality research uh, at, a, at a very uh, high level of productivity, uh, which has a globally recognised impact. And that's a huge treasure for us to, to build on uh, and, in fact, uh, has enabled us to build education as one of our uh, third largest, uh, as our third largest export industry off the back largely of that strong reputation for research. But the area for focus is on translation of that research. How do we make uh, uh, better connections between that research base and the industry base that I said before we need to help to grow? So uh, our report focuses very much on how do we make that nexus between uh, industry and research uh, work much more effectively, acknowledging the tremendous strength of the research that we are blessed to have. The fifth imperative, as they would say in Sesame Street, is a little bit different to the other ones. Um, in the fifth imperative, we said, well, actually, at a system-wide level, again, as we went around the country, we heard time and time again people said, you know, we just don't quite have the right culture. We're not ambitious enough in Australia. We think the time is right. We think as one of the wealthiest nations uh, on earth, and we think with capabilities uh, uh, that are uh, nascent uh, around the country, the time is right to be bold and ambitious. Uh, and I think our report will have more to say on how Australia can tackle bigger and larger challenges uh, in the world of innovation. So that's the outline of the report. As I say, I can't go into too much more detail, but under each of these imperatives, uh, we've made a number of specific recommendations to, to government, 30 in total. Um, I, we are very optimistic, I think, that a report be released uh, in the near future, and we look forward to it starting a conversation. I like to say as I go around, uh, we don't see this as in any sense the last word uh, on the innovation system. We hope it's the start of a very vigorous and vibrant conversation nationally uh, about where we want to go. Uh, we would like to see innovation at the top of the national dialogue um, and we'd like to see people trying and, uh, and throwing new ideas into the mix uh, as, as we go through. But what I can say, uh, despite not being able to talk in too much detail, I can say Bill and I uh, remain very much glass half full that Australia can achieve that goal to be a top tier innovation nation. I believe we can retain our record breaking streak of economic prosperity. And one of the reasons for that um, is that I, I'm tremendously encouraged by what I see in the health and medical research sector. So I want to talk a little bit about why I think uh, the health and medical research system is uh, a tremendous jewel in Australia's innovation system and why other parts of the economy uh, may be able to learn from it. The first, first question or issue I'll address is why is health and medical research so important uh, and important to our innovation system? Well, the first thing is we're actually quite good at it. Uh, as, as Ian mentioned, um, in his introduction, um, and as we've seen over the years, uh, Australia's health and medical research community uh, ranks extremely well uh, on international metrics. And it is important in innovation to build on your strengths. Uh, and health and medical research is undoubtedly one of those. The second thing uh, is that health and medical research enjoys a very broad base of support across the population. That puts us in a very strong uh, position to, uh, to work with the community uh, to tackle new challenges and deliver new benefits in a way the community is very receptive to. Um, and, and thirdly, uh, and perhaps more prosaically, we need it. Uh, as, as was mentioned in the introduction, um, the, the longer term forecast for the costs of healthcare going forward, the longer term uh, forecasts of the, the share of our national wealth that will be taken up uh, keeping ourselves well uh, are, are challenging for Australia as they are for every developed nation. So getting our health and medical research system right and making sure that it's driving ever increasing uh, uh, effectiveness in our healthcare system uh, is, is really, really important. Let me talk about each of those in a little bit more detail. In 2016, uh, the Scientific American uh, Global Scorecard placed Australia number five globally in an assessment of innovation potential in biotech. That's actually a significant climb from number 24 in 2010, so in the space of six years from 24 to five. 
That's actually ahead of Switzerland. Now, if you look at some of the, the, the macro uh, indicators like the Global Innovation Index, you'll see countries like Switzerland come out regularly at the top of that. In health and medical research, in, in biotech, uh, we're actually ahead of them. And we're in the global top three uh, on several indicators, including in, in sub-indicators, number two in size of the biotech public markets, and number three in terms of greatest public company revenues. So the indicators, the underlying indicators, uh, are quite strong. Um, and, and this is widely acknowledged. I'm sure I don't need to tell this audience about the accomplishments of uh, larger firms like Cochlear, ResMed and CSL. Uh, but I'm e equally excited by some of the new emerging success stories, companies like Bionomics, Nanosonics, Surtex, Spinifex, Star Pharma uh, and many more that I could mention. And I note that uh, later this morning uh, there'll be a, a showcase of some emerging startups so you can even get to see uh, some of the, the next generation of emerging startup companies uh, coming through the system. Uh, that's a really strong uh, uh, pipeline that's coming through and it's been growing now for some time. But it's not just about companies. Um, it's also about the, the therapies and the products that can make a real difference. I don't need to, again, to tell this audience about Gardasil, uh, a, a breakthrough for cervical cancer vaccine, um, and things like spray-on skin, which have reduced the need for skin grafts and improved healing times and halved the length of hospital stays for burn patients. Genuine Australian uh, inventions making a big difference. And more recently, um, the, uh, the development at the Walter Eliza Hall Institute in Melbourne of venetoclax, a first-in-class drug for the treatment of people with chronic lymphocytic leukaemia that was approved by the FDA just last year. The venetoclax deal, I think, is really marks a, a fairly significant turning point for uh, biotech innovation in Australia for a couple of reasons. Um, the, the first thing is, um, it's proof that we can take uh, um, new discoveries right from fundamental science through to drug on market. Um, you know, the, the, the underpinning science there uh, was performed several decades ago, and we followed it through uh, and, and done a, a major commercialisation transaction, and it's now a drug approved by the FDA. The second thing uh, that uh, I think was very significant about the deal was announced earlier this year that WeHi uh, did a, a fairly uh, sophisticated royalty monetization deal which enabled them to bring forward some of the value uh, in that transaction which is actually then going to enable them to reinvest that in research now rather than waiting for those royalties uh, to flow in the future. It's a fairly uh, uh, mature and sophisticated deal which I think is really good to see happening uh, in the Australian ecosystem. And, and the other reason why I really like the Venetoclax deal uh, is um, Doug Hilton, who I, I don't think he's in the audience today, but um, and, and the WeHi board, when faced with a windfall gain of uh, you know, several hundred million dollars, um, what were their priorities? Well, one of their priorities um, was to build a childcare centre on site so they could improve the diversity of their research workforce. Uh, and I think that's a really important thing for us as Australians uh, to improve is the, the diversity uh, within our research workforce. And it's great to see uh, the high taking a, a lead in doing that. So I think Venetoclax uh, is, is a really um, uh, pivotal deal in the history of uh, biotech commercialisation in Australia. It's one that we should be celebrating and, and talking about a lot. But coming back to SPHERE, the last E in SPHERE, uh, in the SPHERE acronym is around enterprise. Uh, and I'm particularly impressed um, by the opportunities that uh, many of the Australian government programs are providing uh, today and in the years ahead, which I think will help propel startups, scale ups, and the translation of drugs and devices into the marketplaces of the world, create more deals uh, like Venetoclax. The foundation for all of this uh, was laid uh, a few years ago with the creation of the $20 billion Medical Research Future Fund. Again, this is one of those things that I'm not sure people have fully appreciated uh, the full impact of that. When I last checked, uh, the balance uh, in the fund was about $7 billion. Uh, it's an endowment model, so the, the, the size of the endowment will grow and then the distributions that flow from that will grow uh, with that over time, such that uh, in a few years' time, uh, the MRFF will effectively have doubled uh, the uh, funding available for health and medical research in this country. We as a nation have made a very strong and very broad-based uh, commitment to significantly ramp up health and medical research. That is a tremendous foundation uh, on which to build. And in fact, uh, the advanced health uh, research and translation centres, such as Sphere, have been funded out of uh, the MRFF. That is one of the early initiatives that has flowed um, from the MRFF. 
Another example uh, of an initiative that's been recently announced, uh, which is funded by the MRFF, uh, is the $5 million Biomedtech Horizons program. Uh, this is a, a program managed by MTP Connect, uh, the MedTech and Pharma Growth Centre. Uh, it was recently announced and it's designed to support cutting edge ideas in precision medicine and 3D anatomical printing towards proof of concept and commercialisation, really targeting that translational piece which we think uh, is so important. And if any of you in the audience are, are interested in that, I note that the closing date for EOIs is December the 10th. December the 10th, so um, get your skates on uh, if you'd like to engage with that, uh, that process. And I think Sue McLeeman from the MedTech and Pharma Growth Centre is here at some point uh, over the next couple of days, so um, something to, to talk to her about. But it's not just in, uh, in the research funding area. The other area where the government has made a significant uh, commitment and, and significant input to drive commercialisation is through the Biomedical Translation Fund. Um, in that situation, the, the government provided $250 million matched uh, with private sector money uh, to create a $500 million pool of venture capital funding focused solely on biomedical translation, focused on helping the best ideas, the best technologies from our research community to get through, uh, uh, through to, uh, from early clinical through to the market. Um, and we think that will play a key role uh, in keeping some of the developments, some of the inventions and the development activity uh, here in Australia. There's a number of uh, projects that some of you will be aware of recently funded by the BTF include companies like Saluda Medical, uh, which is developing a novel chronic pain solution involving spinal cord nerve stimulation using a surgically implanted micro device. Um, and Rex Bionics, which is developing a robotic exoskeleton which enables paraplegics to walk again. They're both fantastic examples of Australian expertise and ingenuity and how we, using the combination of great research and, and investment from the likes of the Biomedical Translation Fund, uh, drive significant quality of life improvements. That's, as I said before, what innovation really means, changing the quality of life for all Australians. Along the way, companies like that will require advanced manufacturing, new technologies, new skilled jobs, uh, people uh, with advanced skills and capabilities, which comes back again to that education point. And I'm happy to say that more projects are about to be joining the, the portfolio. The investors uh, are very active every time I speak to them. They say they're seeing good, solid deal flow. Uh, and again, I think if anyone in the audience has an opportunity they think is ready uh, for venture capital, I encourage you uh, to, uh, to get out and engage with one of the three BTF fund managers. And with luck, uh, when we come to a future Sphere Symposium, we can hear a keynote speech from someone who's, who's taken something from uh, a lab or a clinic here in the Sphere Consortium and taken that as a product in a company to the world. But it's not just, as I said before, about money. The, the, the way that the government uh, supports the innovation system is not just about providing funding. Government support for innovation can also be through regulation that facilitates the strategic use of procurement processes and fosters world-leading service delivery standards as well as through responsive regulatory frameworks. An example of this uh, is the government's response to the 2015 Review of Medicines and Medical Devices Regulation. Some of the proposed reforms include greater flexibility and approval of pathways, such as use of overseas assessments from comparable regulators and expedited assessment responses. Australian approvals are not just a requirement for sale in Australia, but are an important prerequisite for endorsement in other countries. So any delay in local approvals has a global impact on the commercialisation of Australian develop, uh, devices. Development of a globally competitive health and medical research industry where more of our own breakthroughs are commercialised in Australia will not only have direct patient benefit through faster access, it'll also mean that we don't have to pay premiums for healthcare advances developed by other nations and strengthening our health and medical research capabilities will reduce our reliance on others and increase our response time when dealing with emerging health challenges of our own. These include a growing and ageing population, an increase in the prevalence of chronic diseases, and a rise in the projected cost of health care from approximately 9% of GDP to over 15% by 2040, as I mentioned before. So, so these are real challenges. Health and medical research offers us solutions to those it's about getting the translation right, and that's why I'm so excited uh, that initiatives like Sphere are helping to bring all of the players uh, together. Because at heart, innovation is a team sport. Collaboration is absolutely essential. I think there is this sometimes persistent notion uh, that innovation relies on, on the lone genius who toils against a sceptical uh, crowd and eventually triumphs with their, their insight and ultimately wins the day. 
Um, what I've learned from nearly 20 years of working with innovators and entrepreneurs uh, is that that's almost never how it really works. Um, successful innovators, successful entrepreneurs gather around themselves a team of people with complementary skills, a team of people that, that has different backgrounds and can bring different perspectives to the incredibly challenging task of, uh, of translating and commercialising uh, innovative uh, research. And so how we bring the sector together is, is really, really important. And that's one of the real reasons why I'm very excited by the role that's played by uh, the Medical Technologies and Pharmaceuticals Growth Centre, MTP Connect. Um, one, of whose one of their tasks is to increase engagement with key healthcare providers to help sector participants to engage in R&T that is driven by clinical needs, driven by market needs, and therefore more likely to achieve com commercial success. The priorities they're chasing include strengthening Australia as an attractive clinical trial research destination. MTP Connect recently published a, a report on clinical trials and highlighted that Australia's clinical trials ecosystem has the potential to surpass $2 billion of annual expenditure in the next 10 years, creating more than 6,000 new high-skilled jobs. The importance of clinical trials to the Australian innovation landscape is also reflected in, uh, in the priorities and the, and the funding allocated uh, by the Medical Research Future Fund. So uh, already to date, $33 million has been allocated from the MRFF to lift clinical trials and registries capacity and better support clinician researchers. And just last week, a further $70 million uh, from the MRFF was announced to support the Next Generation Clinical Researcher Program which expands the funding available through the NHMRC to support clinician researchers. So already we're starting to see the impact of that MRFF funding on translation, uh, and I think that's something that's going to grow. MTP Connect's report on clinical trials noted that Australia can differentiate itself as a highly skilled, cost-effective and efficient clinical trial destination by targeting companies seeking certainty around cost and time, by becoming a specialist provider with skills and expertise in certain areas such as adaptive and complex trials that require access to world-class imaging, pathology and clinical practice. Precisely the kinds of capabilities that the partners in Sphere bring to the table. And look, there have been positive changes in the past few years. Trial startup times have decreased, ethics approvals have been streamlined and there moves to much more consistent costing. But more needs to be done. As we mentioned before, this is a global innovation race uh, and more needs to be done to simplify governance and contracts and to improve the efficiency of patient recruitment. I'm also aware that a third of the 1,300 or more clinical trials initiated each year are sponsored by industry who derive great benefits from the R&D tax incentives and more industry investment in Australian clinical trial capabilities will also benefit the majority of trials which are investigator initiated and run through specialist networks. So we recognise the very important role that plays in our national innovation system. One example of clinical trials, which is particularly dear to my heart as the son of an obstetrician, uh, uh, was last year's trial of the year awarded by the Australian Clinical Trials Alliance, which showed that for pregnant women who rupture their membranes between 34 weeks gestation and terms, it's better not just to, not to deliver the baby immediately. And that's a decision that had split obstetricians even from within same hospital departments. Publication of that study, which was aptly titled the PROMPT study, uh, has changed official guidelines and hospital practice. So these kinds of investigations that improve health outcomes and save money and a testament to the value of connectivity and a testament to the value of very, very tight links between clinical practice uh, and fundamental research. Again, I look forward to seeing plenty of that uh, in Sphere. A further and exciting facilitatory example that will increase the speed of research translation lead to better outcomes is last week's launch of Australia's first large-scale automated biobank at the Royal Prince Alfred Hospital campus. The New South Wales Health statewide biobank brings together the latest technology with internationally recognised quality assurance and streamlined workflows. This ensures samples are preserved to the highest standard, preserving their long-term integrity. At capacity, the biobank will cater for three million human biological specimens. Researchers and clinicians can choose to store some or all of their existing collections in this new facility. And work is also underway to develop a biobanking framework to standardise and improve how biospecimens are collected, processed and stored. It will improve integration between di research, diagnostic and clinical care. It's been led by New South Wales Health Pathology and includes a voluntary certification program based on global best practice and Australian specific legislation, regulations and guidelines applicable to health and medical research. More than 25 biobanks have already signed up to the certification program. 
By turning the idea of biobanking on its head, it's been possible to maintain privacy considerations and obtain broad consent for unspecified research, something that's never been done before. And that's going to be a critical debate that we're going to have uh, in the year ahead, I think, in this country, is to make sure that the ever-increasing uh, stores of data and information are available to inform uh, health research, which is critical to improving the quality of health care. And that is a debate in which I think everyone in this audience uh, will, will need to participate and has a stake in seeing a really positive outcome. Unlike scientific research-driven studies where samples are extensively de-identified, if an unusual result is discovered with the right uh, um, uh, consent mechanisms, the results can be referred back to a clinician with potential patient benefits. And finally, the, one, the other thing that I get very excited about is not just that we are improving our facilities to deal with the physical world, with patient samples, with tissue, uh, and, and the important um, uh, clinical samples that can drive research. We're also advancing very rapidly in the virtual world, in digital health. Um, You'd be aware that earlier this year the government committed substantial resources to the rollout of My Health Record, uh, an opt-out system uh, which will lead to Australia having one of the largest populations of electronic uh, health medical research, uh, records covering large share of the population uh, by late next year. It's been rolled out by Tim Kelsey and colleagues at the Australian Digital Health Agency uh, and uh, represents a huge opportunity for Australia to once again uh, get back close to the leading edge uh, of health innovation. Um, with that combination of, of physical specimens and the digital domain, the digital capability, uh, things like genomics and whole genome sequencing can accelerate the delivery of precision medicine as a key component in a data-driven and integrated healthcare system. So I hope that that quick tour has given you a sense of some of the excitement uh, that we have about the future, one of the re some of the excitement we see in the health and medical research uh, sector. Um, but we're not kidding ourselves. Innovation's not easy. Um, it always feels harder than you want it to be. You always hope that it might get easier, but innovation is hard. It is challenging, uh, and we need to work at it. I think Australia has good reason to be confident, but not complacent, that it can be a top-tier innovation nation. And in closing, I want to congratulate you on everything that Sphere has achieved to date uh, and, and uh, many of the achievements that Ian outlined earlier on. I challenge you, as I did at the start, not merely to be as good as best practice internationally, but to be better, to think really big, to aim really high, and to be bold in innovating in a way that we in Australia possibly haven't done as well as we could. And I remind you, most of all, to keep telling the stories of what you are doing. Innovation matters, it makes uh, lives, it makes improvements to the lives of everybody, but people only develop a culture of innovation if they hear stories about it, if they hear stories about how it is changing the world. So I hope that you will continue to tell those stories to help change our culture of innovation uh, and drive a stronger innovation nation. And with that, I wish you success as you work together for good health and wellbeing. Thank you.